I want to um, I want to just talk to people here this morning right now or who are let's say 23 and under okay so th- those of you that are here this morning I'm just using that relatively right early 20s and under uh, and I'm going to tell you something that happened way back in history <laughs> because you wouldn't remember it but you might know about it like likely you know about it so back in the late 90s, way back in history, right? There was this thing. Um, there was this thing called the millennial bug, more uh, popularly known as Y2K. Some of you remember that. Now you're like, oh, yeah, that was kind of a crazy thing, right? So Y2K was, it was a real scare um, on a global scale. And certainly in America, there was this, um, there was this thing. There was thought to th- that was going to, thought to occur where they were going to just have this this computer induced apocalypse, basically, right? So computer program pr- computers that like ran the grids, like the power grids and all of that, were were designed programmed under a two digit system for the year, and so when the year two thousand you know came around. The big fear was it was going to read it as 1900 and not 2000. And so they were, there was this big concern for real that, that the whole power grid was going to crash and they didn't know what to do. Now, unbeknownst to most of us, there were these experts who like did actually take it serious and they went in and they really worked hard to reset the system and put it on a four-year a four-year cycle or, or a, a program. And so you're like, okay, glad somebody who cared about that. But just on a, like, everyday person level, it was, like, it was different, right? And, um, and I was pastoring my first church. I was in my late 20s and just a couple of years into pastoring my first church. And I, it was, like, kind of an interesting thing to try to navigate. Um, because you could put people in basically three, one of three categories. First, there were the preppers. <laughs> some of you are like, I wonder if some of them ever actually came out of their bunkers, or are they still there eating that dehydrated food? We're not 100% sure. We couldn't find them. These, the preppers were people, like they went off grid, right? They, they established, they really, there were some that really did build bunkers. They stockpiled food. They stockpiled fuel, ammunition, and other necessities, right? I mean, this is like, this is what they did because they were, cons- they were sure that the apocalypse was going to happen on January 1st, 2000. So there were the preppers, and, but then there were the pranksters. And they, of course, made fun of the preppers, but they made fun of the whole thing. They thought pretty much the whole thing's a big fat joke. And then there were the people who were the prepared these were people who, they didn't, they weren't preppers, they certainly weren't pranksters, but they, they tried to, you know, take it seriously, take some precautionary measures just in case something did happen. So they, they, they probably had a, 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 a st- some supply of food, some supply of water, uh, maybe even getting, making sure that they had an, an alternate source of heat because, again, this was going to be in January, so wintertime. And... Um, as I said, as a, as, as, a, as a new pastor, you know, newer, younger guy in, in, in ministry, I was like trying to figure out how to navigate this because I had all three types or groups of people in the church. I had pe- pe- the preppers are telling me, listen, I just ordered my like 11, 55 gallon drum of diesel. And, um, you know, we're, we're still digging the hole for the bunker. I'm like, man, this is crazy. And, of course, they wanted me to make sure that, you know, that everybody in the church was prepped just like they were. And it's like, oh, man, it was tough. You know, you're trying to say, well, you kind of look like a wing nut right now. But you couldn't say that because they had all the ammunition, right? <laughs> so just joking, just joking. But it really was interesting. It, it really was, and to, and to, it was honestly, it was like, I don't normally stay up uh, until midnight for New Year's, but of course, who didn't that night? Uh, w- like you know, we were partying like it was 1999. Um, <laughs> s- that was su- super bad, super bad. Um, but when the clock did strike 
you know, midnight, January 1st, and the power was still on, it was like, okay, this is good, right? Glad somebody took care of it. If it really ever was actually a thing, I don't know, maybe subject to opinion, but uh, I, I was glad the power was still on, and, w- and we survived it. Well, we've been, we've been in this go- gospel of Matthew now for, for a quite, a, quite a long time, and, and we did this sub-series this fall on chapters 23, 24, and 25. Most of you are aware of that. For those of you that aren't, they just get you in the flow. And we called it The End is Near because, um, because uh, we're nearing the end of Matthew's gospel, just 28 chapters as a whole. We'll finish those chapters up next year. But, but we called it The End is Near mainly because particularly chapters 24 and 25 give some of the, the largest amount of information that Jesus gave us with regard to actually the, the end of time. And so we worked through those parables, worked through that teaching, and it brought up these really major subjects that I thought on the tail end of the End is Near series, let's take three weeks and just walk through those major subjects to make sure that, we, that, w- that we're grasping what's there. So a couple of weeks ago, we did, we did one message on the kingdom of heaven, which is one of Matthew's great themes. And so it was kind of a thematic message covering these various uh, texts on the kingdom of heaven because, um, friends, that's the eternal. The earth and life as we know it right now, that's not eternal. It's, it's not going to stay this way forever. It, at some point, that's, there's going to be an end. And, uh, and we want to be ready for what's next because the end, um, as we know it, isn't actually the end. And so that's really important for us to grasp the kingdom of heaven. And then last week, I tried to take on this, um, as Michael, our discipleship pastor, called it, this Herculean effort to, um, to take all of this teaching in, in the Bible, um, not all of it, but like try to take the substantive parts or, the, or kind of the big highlight parts of the, of the teaching of the Bible that, that talk about uh, the, the events of the end and... Um, because there's a series of events that, uh, that unfold, I try to put them in chronological order and make sure that we're, like, are we informed, are we ready, and all of those sorts of things. And then this week, we're going to take the last little swipe at the end is near, and I want to put a, I want to try to simplify it. I want to make it as, as easy for us to, to grasp as possible, and we'll just have a basic checklist, if you will, just a checklist to make sure that we know what is expected of us in order to fare well when the end does come, right? So it's not about, like, do we need to be preppers? No, we better not be pranksters. That's not going to be a super smart posture. But are we going to be prepared? Because at some point, and we don't know when that's going to be, at some point, Jesus is actually going to return, and, um, and the last thing, the last thing that we want is to not be prepared for that. There's so many important things in life, things that cause us to lose a little sleep at night, things that cause us angst and, you know, oh man, there's so many important things in life. But really, ultimately, there, there isn't actually anything that even compares to how important it is to being ready for the return of Jesus Christ and the establishment of the eternal kingdom of God. So we don't want to be over-focused and be those kind of preppers. We don't want to be indifferent to it. That's not the right posture, but we do want to be prepared. And the reason I I say that is because I I want to make sure that we understand the balance. There's a necessary balance in this because when you start studying about the end times, it can be so fascinating and captivating that it actually carries us into an out-of-balance position that the Bible doesn't lead us to. We can get so caught up in the events and what's going to happen and then we can just get like kind of get jacked up about it. And, um, and what we ne- need to recognize as students of the Bible is simply, so we've got this book, right? This is, the, this is God's revelation to us and it does. It gives us, it tells us about the future in very dramatic terms gives us pictures and glimpses of what it's going to be like. But friends, the super majority of what this book does is it tells us how to live and honor God today in everyday real life, right? So 
that, that's the balance we want, is, is to be prepared, but not over-focused and certainly not indifferent, all right? Now, at, at those of you that are part of City Point Church, you know that typically we are, we're committed to expositional preaching where we take passages of the, of the scriptures, whole books and chapters and line by line, and we just work through the text. And, um, and the challenge with, with that is, um, or, or the challenge with a day like today is, there isn't a single passage that gives us that picture. And so today, we're basically going to say the entire Bible is our text, and we're going to focus on um, some of the highlights, okay? So no, we're not going to work through the entire Bible this morning, just parts of it. But, but to give us kind of that, again, it's that checklist that we want to do. So, um, so I've got four things, and, um, and, and the, the first one, boy, it really shouldn't be a surprise to anybody who's... Um, who's aware of any sort of content from the Bible. The first, absolute first, and most important checklist item is for you and for me to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. It, it, like, friends, that, if there's, if you could say, well, what's the one thing I need to do? That's the one thing. There's other things, and we're, we made a short list today, but if there's the one thing that you could do, that's the one thing. This is what Jesus taught. Now, John 17, you'll see this verse come up. John 17 is Jesus teaching his disciples literally just a short period of time before he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, wrestles with his father about God's will being done and not his because he has to face the cross where he's going to bear the sin of the world. He's going to die a criminal's death and suffer in that way for this for us. And then he's going to be put in a... In, in a tomb for three days. And then because he's the Lord of life and death cannot hold him, he comes out of the grave. But going through that agony is just like, Jesus said that he was sorrowful. His soul was in such anguish at that point, knowing that he had to bear that, that guilt, that condemnation that all of us deserve, that he, his soul was in agony to the point where he felt as if he could die just from that. So that is torturous to his, to his soul, let alone what his body was going through. And so he's instructing his disciples. We get the Last Supper, all of that sort of thing. And then he gets to John 17, and it's, it's what we call the high priestly prayer, where Jesus, in the presence of his disciples, is praying to the Father. So his disciples are hearing him pray this prayer. And this is part of the prayer, verse 3. He's talking to the, the Father, and he says, and this is eternal life. That's a definitive statement, friends. This is eternal life. That they, his disciples, then and now, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Right? And this is eternal life. If you want eternal life. Your goal, as I established last week, to be or not to be is not the question. Because once you are, you will always be. You were created by God to exist eternally. Where you spend eternity is actually the right question. Where will I spend eternity? And if you want eternal life, there's only one way to obtain it. And it's to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's not an, an arrogant, bigoted, narrow-minded position that, dis, that discredits every single philosopher and religion in the entire world. It's actually a quote from Jesus who said, there's only one way to the Father, and it's him. And the reason for that isn't, isn't because Jesus is the one who's the only one in the, all of history who's ever said smart and good things. It's because Jesus is the only one in all of history who could and did bear our sins and pay the price for our forgiveness and our reconciliation to God. So that's, that's not a, a narrow-minded position, friends. It's a way of highlighting the only way in which God has said people can approach him. He is the only true God, and he has sent Jesus Christ, his son, to be our Savior. And so Jesus says, this is eternal life, that they, us, that we would know God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom 
you have sent. Years ago, in fact, the same church where I was at that um, where the whole Y2K thing was taking place, and actually around the same time, there was a man in that community that I did not know. I actually had grown up uh, with his son, but we went to different schools, but I did not know this man. And he was a, he was a Harley guy. He loved Harleys, had several of them. And, um, and one day he had just purchased a new bike, and man, he was just feeling it, loving it, right? And, uh, and this guy, uh, by his own admission, was a guy who was very far from God in his soul, in the way he was living his life. He just was like, a, he, he did not know God and was not in any way trying to order his life in a way that would honor God. And, um, and, and one day he's on his brand new bike, just got it, and, and he's cruising down the road, feeling like he's all that in a bag of chips, and he gets wham, somebody T-bones him. And it's a massive, major accident, the kind that, you know, like makes the local news sort of a thing. And he nearly dies. He spends weeks, weeks and weeks, months really, in rehab. And, um, and as he's finally able to get on his feet, his ankles were literally bolted together, and he walked like this. He walked into the local Harley-Davidson shop, which was just down the road from the church building where I was the pastor. And he goes to the owner of the shop, and, um, and of course, he hadn't seen him for months. And, and he says to this guy, he says, you know, I'm thankful to be alive, but I don't know who to thank. And I thought that's the most unbelievable statement, right? I'm thankful to be alive, but I don't know who to thank. And this guy, I, I, I'd only met him a couple times. We had a school there, and he had a little girl that was in our school, and he gets, like, super aggressive with this guy, puts his finger in his chest, and he backs him up, and he says, you need to go to the church that I was a pastor. You need to go there on Sunday morning and give your life to Jesus. Like, it felt a little more, a little more aggressive than I think I, my approach would have been. But So this guy, Sunday morning rolls around, and he... I, I'm up front. I kind of sat, you know, kind of the front like here, like I do here. And so I'm up there. All the people are there. The band is playing, and, um, and, and they're singing, and, and, and he, uh, I don't know, he's coming, but he walks up this aisle, hobbles up, comes over to me, and he says, introduces himself, shakes my hand, and he says, I'm, I'm here. This is what he said. I'm here to give my life to Jesus is now a good time. <laughs> I said, no, man, I'm trying to sing these songs. What are you doing? <laughs> oh, I said, no, that was a great time. So I, I talked with him, and we prayed together, and it was actually the start of a, an incredible story, an incredible um, friendship that, that developed, and how God restored his body, and his wife came to know the Lord, his son and his daughter-in-law, his daughter and his son-in-law. I had the privilege of baptizing the whole family, dedicating their children as their kids were starting to have kids. It was just like pretty, pretty remarkable. And I don't know, for those of you that are followers of Christ, I don't know what it was, what the circumstances were where you finally like realized, wait a second, Maybe you always believed in God. Maybe you, you didn't. But at some point, it dawned on you like, man, I, I need a Savior. I, I'm accountable to God, and I need His forgiveness. At some point, it's like the lights came on. It dawned on you, right? And for some of you, you're little, like little kids. You're like four, five, six years old, and you're like, I need Jesus. You're like, yes, you do need Jesus. And for others, I was 19 and was very far from God. For you, what it, I don't know what it was. Next week, we're going to baptize some people. For them, it was recent. But maybe the circumstances were really tough where you're, where you're searching and trying to figure out life and things are falling apart and your heart is aching. For me, man, I felt like I was on top of the world and then all of a sudden my dad gets diagnosed with stage 4 colon cancer and is dying. I was wrestling in college and injured my neck and shoulder again and ended my, my wrestling career. 
And I was trying to figure out what's happening, like what is going on. And in the meantime, my then girlfriend gave me a Bible and I started reading it while I was laying in bed at night because I couldn't sleep. And it dawned on me. I'm accountable. I, I believe there was a God, but I didn't really ever actually measure that I was accountable to him and that I was guilty before him. And I needed his forgiveness. You remember what that was like for you? See, for those of you who don't know that, have not experienced that yet, please understand, I'm not talking about you knowing about Jesus. It's not about knowing some facts and some information about God and about his son, Jesus Christ. It's actually about you knowing him in a very personal way. If you want eternal life, you've got to know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. Be reconciled to God. So you think, well, when's a good time? Any time's a good time. Like right now is a good time. Give your life to Christ. Be reconciled to God. Know him. Know him. And the, and the reality is this. Jesus is coming back at some point. And when he comes back, if you don't know him, as your Savior, before you meet him as your judge, it's too late. At that point, it's too late. Right. So receive him as your Savior. Be reconciled to God. If there's, if there's, well, that's the reason why that's the first one, because it's the most important one. That's the one that matters, friends. And it, all the other ones, they are important, but they're secondary. In fact, if you miss the first one, it doesn't matter what else you do. Know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Okay, let's go on. Number two, the second one it would be to embrace your new self. And when I say that, I'm not, I'm not asking you to give yourself a hug, okay? Embrace your new self. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she, is a new creation. Again, I, I go back. You think back to the, if you are a follower of Christ, think back to the day. And I know for me, I, like I, I remember it was a decision. It was decision time. God was calling me to himself, but I was, um, and I was trying to figure out what that looked like. And when I finally Receive Christ as my Savior. I like I don't know. I don't understand. I did not at that moment, and I'm still trying to discover everything that that meant. I didn't understand what was taking place. I just knew that I, I believed that there was a God. I was accountable to Him. I was guilty and needed His forgiveness, and Jesus was the solution. And and when I prayed to receive Christ. I knew something was different. And in fact, the girlfriend, who's my wife of 30 plus years now, um, the one who had given me the Bible, I remember walking out of the building that we had been in, and we were walking across this parking lot, and I, and I remember saying to her, I don't know, I don't know quite what just happened, but something's different. I could, I could tell it. Something was different. Well, that something that was different is that I was a new creation. The Bible puts it in such amazing dramatic terms. Terms like this, you were dead in your trespasses and your sins, but God made you alive in Christ, right? As a present reality, you were dead, now you're alive. You were blind, now you can see. There's a new creation work that takes pr place, friends. This is just really simple but deep gospel, good news, truth, where we rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. We were born into the kingdom of God, and we are literally new creations in Christ. And so when I say checklist number two, embrace your new self. Who is this new self? Well, we could spend 
a long time talking about that, but let me give you seven quick things. Who are you? Who is your new self when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Well, you belong to God. No, no longer are you a stranger or an orphan out in this world just trying to figure things out on your own. You're never alone again. You belong to God. He purchased you back from sin. You belong to him, not just because he created you, but because he bought you. You belong to God. You are one of his children, and you have to embrace that. You don't always feel that, that affection. Sometimes you feel it with all of your heart, and other times it feels distant and cold, but it is a truth that we have to embrace whether we're feeling it or not. You want to be ready for Jesus' return? Remember who you are. You belong to God. You are a child of God. You are forgiven. Embrace that. Man, I'm sure, like me, there are things that you could think about that you still can recall that you did before you were a Christian. That you go, oh, man, I'm... I'm, I'm still, I'm not telling, right? I'm not telling about those things. God, God has forgiven those things. Friends, literally, the, the, the record has been rubbed out. Yeah, you can recall them, but Jesus paid the price, and you're no longer accountable for those things. You are forgiven, and you need to embrace that. Sometimes people, they allow their past to haunt them for so long, and it, it's debilitating. It keeps them from walking well with their Lord. Embrace it. You belong to God and you are forgiven. You are loved. Friends, embrace that. You are loved. God loves you with a loyal love, an everlasting love. Like the old saying goes, God knows you and he still loves you. And, and I don't know if that comforts you, but it comforts me an awful lot, not just because of my past, but because of life even now. God loves me. God loves you. And, and, and then, of course, if, as we're embracing this new self, we turn this corner. Somewhere in this mix, we, 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 we embrace that we belong to God. We know that we've been forgiven. We know that we're loved. And here's the corner turn. We are loving. You know, you, yeah, we don't always feel that way, but embrace the new self. Embrace who you are as a new creation. You are a loving person. I think some people, like you need to write that on the mirror in your bathroom, you know, in your bathroom. I am loving. Because that's who God is making you into, a loving person. You are strong. This is who you are. As a new creation, you are are strong because God is the one who strengthens you. Oh, friends, it's been abused at times, but the truth that we get from Philippians 4, that we can do all things through him who strengthens us. Again, I say it's, been a, it's been misapplied, ripped out of its context many times. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. doesn't mean that as a boxer you can beat up every single opponent. It doesn't mean you can sprout wings and fly away. But you can do all things through Christ because he strengthens you. He strengthens those who wait upon him. You are loving and you are strong. And you, at some point, you've got to believe this is what God has done and is doing in your soul. You're growing. You're growing. Ah, at times the, the progress seems so slow, sometimes agonizingly slow. But have you ever seen a tree grow? No. No, because the, the growth is too slow to observe with your eyes. And that's kind of like the growth that we see depicted of Christians, of followers of Christ in the Bible, who change, who grow, who develop and mature from one degree of glory to the next, just one degree. 
I, I wish I could go like 60 degrees at once, 80 degrees at once. That'd be awesome, right? But it's one degree. God is growing. You are growing. Embrace your new self. And here's one, last one here, that you are Jesus' ambassador. This is who you are. Sometimes people want to... Um, uh, want to elevate others, uh, maybe like a pastor, and think, oh, that person is a, they're a real ambassador for Christ. They're like the official representatives of Jesus. Mm, that's, actually, that's actually not 100% true. I get what you're saying there and this idea of you want to honor those who are in those areas of leadership. I get that. But that's not quite what we're supposed to see because Jesus makes every single one of his followers an official representative of him in this world. You, if you're a follower of Christ, are an ambassador. You are, you are meant to represent Jesus everywhere you go in this world. Everywhere you go, right? Even your own living room, your place of work, your next door neighbor, you're an ambassador of Christ. And we have to remember that. We've got to embrace, oh, oh, whoa, I'm not my own anymore. I don't get to just do my thing. I don't get to just force my will. I'm actually supposed to represent Jesus right now, right? Embrace your new self. So when Jesus tells us, his disciples, to be ready for his return, embracing our new self is definitely a part of that. Now, being a part of that also includes, number three, killing off your old way of life. And friends, these two things go hand in hand. Embracing your new self and killing off your old way of life are actually always talked about in the Bible together. You don't do one without the other. It's not an either or proposition. Well, I'm just going to kill off the old way of life. No, no, no. You have to do both. Colossians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 4 all talk about this. Colossians 3 says, when Christ who is your life appears. Now, what are we talking about? Being ready for the return of Christ. So here it is. When Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. If you're a follower of his, friends, that's the moment when all of a sudden, like we talked about last week, the mortal will put on immortality. The corruptible will put on incorruption. In the twinkling of an eye, just like that, when Christ appears, you also will appear with him. And he says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. It is because Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, we will be caught up with him. When that happens, because that's going to happen, we're supposed to put to death. We're supposed to kill off our old way of life. That's our motivation for self-denial, dying to self, getting rid of these things that are not glorifying to God in our lives, changing the way our, we think changing our behavior, all of those things are part of that. And some of it's, some of it's like the super easy, low-hanging fruit stuff, and others, others, it's much more subtle. Prior to coming to faith in Christ, we, we all learned how to function in life. Like, in some cases, like it was survival skills, because life is difficult, and there's brokenness, all around us and within us, and we try to figure out how to, how to make it in life. And some of, some of what we learned was okay. It's like, oh, okay, that's how you learned it. That's all right. And the other things that we learned are not okay, and, and they, need to be, they need to be killed off. I know for me, from my childhood forward, I had honed a, a particular skill. It's hard, it's hard to even think about this. But I, I honed this particular skill where, where I could, from my heart, I could cut people off that I had previously cared about. But because they disappointed me or hurt me, I was able to cut them off from my heart and from my life and leave them and, and really like not even feel anything toward them anymore. It was a survival skill. And I guess in, in that state, I, I, I learned how to do that. And 
it wasn't right, but you're like, well, you just got to try to figure out how to make it in life when you have a lot of different hurts and a lot of pain. You try to figure out how to keep going, right? And it was interesting because very shortly after coming to faith in Christ and that new creation coming about, I had an opportunity, a massive opportunity, disappointed and hurt once again. I actually called this person and said, you know what? You clearly don't need me. I do not need you. You are out of my life. Goodbye. (laughs) And it was like two minutes after hanging up the phone. I felt, I've never heard God's voice audibly, but I just, all, it wasn't my thinking because I had never even processed this before. I felt like the Lord was speaking to my soul. And he said, Brent, you're in my family now. And in my family, that's not how we do things. You need to call that person back and apologize. And I was like, are you kidding me? not calling them back and apologizing. They're the ones that need to apologize. I mean, I was like, I was doing what I had done. I, I, was hon- I, I had honed that skill. I was, I, they were already exiting my, my heart. I was like walking away from a relationship that you're not supposed to walk away from, even if you've been hurt. But the Lord prevailed, and I called him back, and I said, listen, I... I I, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Christ now, and, and God has told me that I'm not supposed to treat you like that. And I don't remember everything I said, but they accepted my apology, and they apologized to me, and thanks be to God, that relationship is, is still intact. But it was hard. It was hard. And the reality is none of us, prior to knowing Jesus, had life figured out, and we're living it all the way we were supposed to. In fact, we had lots of things backwards and upside down and wrong. And this process of learning how to follow Jesus is just that. It's this process where you, where you're, you're, you realize, oh, whoa, I guess I'm not supposed to do it like that. I guess there's a better way to do that, a way that honors God. Right? And so, it's like, think about it. Some of you, some of you grew up, and you, like, you got your finances so messed up, so tangled up, so messed up. And then, as a Christian, you're like, wait a second, I'm not supposed to do it like that. There's a better way to do that. And so you start trying to figure out how to untangle it. And sometimes it takes a long time, but it's worth doing. It's worth doing because you're supposed to honor God in that way. And others, it's about relationships. And others, it's about the internal stuff that's going on and so on and so on. None of us were living the way we were supposed to prior to coming to faith in Christ. All of us have these old ways that need to be killed off. So let me just give you a couple. Uh, Again, seven. I don't know why I picked seven. It's just seven. Again, the list could be a hundred things long, but let's just talk for just a moment about a few things. Number one, to kill off your old way of life, you've got to disavow pride. Disavow pride. It comes so natural for us. Some maybe more than others, I don't know, but it's something that we have to be constantly aware of because there's just something in the human soul that wants to be arrogant that wants to be prideful, that wants to think that we're the most important thing and we're supposed to be at the top of the list. And we've got to disavow that. Pride. Spurn immorality. This is something that isn't a once, once upon a time I said no longer I'm going to do that. This is something, especially with the forces that exist within us and the supercharged sexual world that we live in today where we're constantly bombarded with stuff, we have to spurn that every single day. And if you find yourself failing in that battle, if you find yourself losing that battle, you have to get somebody to help you. I guarantee you there are people in this church that will help you without any shame, without any sort of condescending or looking down at you. You, if you're losing that battle, ask for help and you will get it gladly from brothers and sisters who care deeply about you and who will not look down on you. Number three, turn down retaliation. 
oh, man, that comes so easy, doesn't it? Somebody hurts you, you're like, oh, I'm going to get them. You wait, I'm going to get them. Mm-mm, mm-mm, turn it down. It's an offer that you're supposed to decline. It comes instantly, though, doesn't it? Turn down retaliation. Scrap, number four, scrap vulgar talk. Fr- friends, enough of this. Like, I know some people... Uh, oh, we're talking about profanity. We're talking about slander. We're talking about gossip. We're talking about lies. I'm, I'm like, are you a Christian? Like, are you a Christian? Then remember that you're a representative of Christ. Clean it up. Right? Ask God to help you. There, you're, you're not going to... This is this argument I've heard. Okay, it's like I've, I've matured enough in my faith where I feel like it's okay. I'm like, Really? You heard God say that to you, even though the Bible says other, otherwise. Ah, clean it up, man. Refrain, scrap vulgar talk. Number five, refrain from anger. Again, oh, that, that's just so easy. That's an actual musical term. That comes out of Psalm 37. Refrain. You know, it just means pause, just pause. The anger builds up, and it just, like, sometimes it's a flash, but, but the Bible tells us to refrain. Pause. Stop, pray, ask for help, refrain from anger. If you express it, it's probably not going to produce the fruit that you're hoping for. Number six, dismiss covetousness. I picture it's like a a teacher who's got a class in front of him or in front of her, and class is over. And so what do they do? Class is over, class dismissed. And again, covetousness, like anger, like retaliation, it comes so easy. It comes so easy for us to want things in an envious way that other people have. There's pride involved in that. There's broke, there's just a broke, just dismiss it, friends, dismiss it. Court contentment. Be happy for other people and their successes and be content and labor, work hard for what you have and and be thankful for that. Dismiss it as a follower of Christ, whether you have a lot or whether you have a little. Don't be covetous. Dismiss it. Dismiss it. Number seven, slay your idols. Slay your idols. Kill off your old way of life. An idol is, by definition, anything or anyone that is more important to you than God. And it's really easy to allow things to slip into that place. If something or someone gets more attention and more affection than God does in your life, that's probably an idol, including yourself. Sometimes self-worship is the worst type. And, and, and another, another way to look at this idolatry is, is, is to think about anything or anyone that we ask to do something for us that God has said he would do for us. That's likely an idol. You see this a lot. People ask things like alcohol or drugs to do for them what God said he would do for them. God says he's the one who will give rest to our souls, but what do we say? I just, I just, I just need a couple of drinks. I just got to unwind. I don't think that's the right posture. The Bible does not put an absolute prohibition against the consumption of alcohol, but there are very strong warnings to it that we need to be wise about and not foolish. And if we're asking alcohol or drugs or any other substance to do for us at a soul level what, what God has said he would do for us, give us peace, give us rest, etc., maybe we should put it away. Maybe it's part of killing off the old self. You're, you've learned a way to do things that is, not, that is not in keeping with what it means to honor God in that way. So kill off your old, old way of life. It's an, it could be an idol. So embracing the new self, as I said, and killing off the old way of life, they're not either or propositions. They're both and. The scriptures always present them together. Last thing, number four in our, in our uh, being prepared for um, Jesus' return is to practice what you know. Practice what you know. Philippians 3.16 puts it like this. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. We haven't become everything that we ought to be yet. God is still growing us. God is still developing us. But what we do know, 
is enough. Like, there isn't probably any of us, especially those of us who are followers of Christ, we know enough to be faithful to God. Right? We know enough to be faithful to God. So let us live up, let us hold true to what we've already attained. Some, most of you have probably seen this movie, The Gla- Gladiator. Remember Gladiator? Russell Crowe. It's like this epic saga, you know, these Roman gladiators and all of this. And there's this scene at the start of the movie like that's just so great. You, you kind of want to have a big screen television for this. Turn the volume way up. The Roman army is g- gathered in Germania and the German hordes are in, the, in these trees and they're calling out and they're taunting the Romans and, and the Romans are about to, as the movie says, unleash hell on them. And Russell Crowe is with the infantry behind the German hordes. They don't even know it, but they're back there with all these horses and their, their swords and spears and all of that. And he's talking with his men. And he says to them, hold the line. Stay with me. Hold the line. And then, you know, all of a sudden you hear the, the thunder of the horse's hooves and his big German shepherd is running alongside him and these guys are just going, right? And, and the battle starts to... Su- and you hear Russell Crowe as they're thundering through this dense forest. Hold the line. Stay with me. And this is essentially what the Apostle Paul is saying in Philippians 3.16. Hold true to what you have already attained. Hold the line. By definition, it means to agree on a position conceived of as being in proper battle formation with other soldiers. Hold true to what you've already attained. Hold the line. Jesus is saying, stay with me. If you want to be ready for my return, hold the line. Stay with me. Practice what you know. So three things quickly. What do you know? Well, you know, number one, adhere to the body of Christ. Stick with the church. Some people, they, again, you stick around the church long enough and you're going to get hurt at some point. Somebody's going to offend you. Somebody's going to do something they shouldn't have done, say something they shouldn't have said. Hold the line. Stick with the church through thick and through thin. Adhere. Stay attached to the family of God. We're meant to be together. And it is is an act of ungodliness to extract yourself from the church. A Christian who is not attached to a local church is in trouble like a lone sheep is in a land that is roamed by wolves and lions. Adhere to the body of Christ. Practice what you know. Secondly, repent quickly. Repent quickly. It's, wouldn't it be great if we could just say, well, you know, I'm pretty much, I'm done with sin. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to think all the right thoughts and I'm going to say all the right things and I'm going to do all the right things and I'm just not going to sin anymore. And if you think that you can do that, you're self-deceived. fact is you and I are not done with sin. We'd like to be, but when we want to do good, evil's right there with us. And we're going to do and say things that we shouldn't. And it's not an excuse, but it's a reality. Practice what you know. What do you know? Repent quickly. Do not leave unresolved guilt in your soul because of what it does to your soul and because of what it does to the people around you. And you often, when people are trying to live with unresolved guilt, They are unraveling the relationships around them, doing damage to those relationships, and they're mostly unaware, but nobody else is unaware. Everybody else is taking taking the blows, thinking, what in the world is going on? This isn't right. So repent quickly. Confess your sins to God. He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. We should know that. Lastly, engage in Jesus' mission wholeheartedly. If you want to be ready, one of the best ways to be prepared for Jesus' return is to be helping others get ready and stay ready for his return. See, the problem with the preppers, 
is that they're preoccupied with getting ready for the apocalypse and they've stopped doing what Jesus told them to do. He didn't say hoard a bunch of stuff and batten down the hatches and wait. He said go into all the world and bring the good news of my salvation to everybody so that every tribe, tongue, and nation hears the good news and can receive eternal life. The problem with the pranksters is they don't take seriously the fact that Jesus will return. And so they're off goofing around, playing. They're not ready themselves and they're not helping anybody else get ready either. They're just a big fat distraction. Engage in Jesus' mission wholeheartedly. Take your life. Have fun, but take it seriously. Most of us, as I said, know more than we need to know in order to be faithful to God. Yes, we should continue to learn. Yes, we, sh- yes, we c- can continue to grow. But, but practice what you know, and that'll be enough. So let's wrap this up. Back to Y2K, remember? Some of you remember that. Kind of a crazy time. Those preppers all hunkered down to avoid that computer-induced apocalypse. The pranksters, everything's just a big, big joke to them. And then there were the prepared, who took those reasonable precautionary measures. Thankfully, what was thought to happen didn't happen. But concerning the return of Christ, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when when Jesus comes back will you be prepared it's a pressing question friends like if you were to evaluate right this minute in these three categories which one would you fall in you're a prepper you're a prankster or are you prepared our big idea this morning when Jesus returns you want to be prepared not preoccupied Let's bow in prayer. This is a good opportunity for us to just take a few moments. As the team plays, you contemplate. Ask God to speak to you about where you are and how you should respond. Have you embraced your new self? Are you killing off your old way of life? Are you practicing what you know? Most importantly, for those of you who aren't yet followers of Christ, know Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior. This very day, you can do that. This very day, talk with somebody who has a lanyard on. Talk to one of our elders. Talk to one of our pastors. They will gladly talk with you, lead you in prayer. Don't let the day pass. Today is a good day to get right with God. Father, thank you for your mercy, for your grace. Thank you for truth. I'm so grateful for City Point Church and for all of the people that are gathered here this morning. So thankful for them, Lord. I ask for you to establish each one strong, firm, and steadfast. Bring them to that place. Lord, if there's things in their lives that need to be reevaluated, give them courage and lead them, empower them by your spirit. Reveal your truth and your grace to them, Lord, that we might all be ready, prepared when Jesus returns. Thank you, Lord. Amen.